we're going to have a look at this question that comes under the nature of proof. So read it with me and let's think about a couple of approaches we could use to prove this result. Prove that a cubed minus a is divisible by 6 for all values of a such that a is an integer. Okay, how do we go about this? Now, one of the first things that might come to your mind when you look at a question like this is whether a tool like mathematical induction might be useful here. Now, uh, we can use mathematical induction to prove this result. And you can think, all right, if I don't need any kind of you know, sophisticated knowledge beyond extension one, I might as well just go with that, right? But there is a reason why, in fact, a couple of reasons at least, why using mathematical induction to prove this particular result is less than ideal. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, what those reasons are, and then I'm gonna show you an alternative path for actually proving this result that doesn't rely on induction at all. So let's have a think about how I would lay this out if I were to do this by induction. Uh, what's the first step when you begin any proof by mathematical induction? And the answer is you need to test the base case, the first place, uh, the first value where this statement is true. Now this is where you run into your first snag because when you have a think about okay, what am I going to test? What value of A should I choose? And the answer is well, for the set of integers, there's no agreed upon starting point that will cover all of the numbers that you need. For example, if you start from n equals zero, and then you just start counting up, one, two, three, four, five, six, you have missed like half of the integers, all of the negative ones, right? Um, you could start from some number earlier on, like negative one or negative two or negative three, but you still run up against this fact that Induction, as we have learnt it, is a monodirectional process. So it's always going to start from one value, the base case, and then keep on going in one direction. Now, this is not an you know impossible barrier to overcome. If you think back to when we proved uh, De Moivre's theorem, we could actually do that by mathematical induction. And I actually showed you know if you start off by saying, look, let's have uh, this statement here and consider it for zero, one, and two, it becomes uh, and so on. Uh, it becomes a fairly straightforward use of some trigonometric identities and some rearrangement. You can prove this, and then you just need to cover the negative integers. So you need to use some other trigonometric identities to handle that, you use the result that we just proved for um, positive values of n, and then off you go, it's fine for the negative values too. But it's worth uh, keeping in mind that this is not just going to be, if we use mathematical induction, it's not just going to be a straight proof. We're going to have to handle half of the cases. So here you can see me choosing uh, you know, 1 as my first value, and then I'm going to have to do all that work and consider the negatives as well. So. First snag, sort of addressed, I haven't solved it, but I, I know it's there. My second snag comes after I do the assumption step. You can see I'm just going to uh, assume that this is true for some arbitrary value of A. And what I can say is, using some of the notation that we have learned recently in uh, the nature of proof, uh, there exists some value of P which where P is one of the integers, such that K cubed minus K is 6 times p. So what I'm saying here is uh, k cubed minus k is going to be some multiple of 6, which is analogous equivalent to saying it's divisible by 6. And we know the assumption step isn't a whole lot of work. It's the proof step, not for k, but for k plus 1, where the real rubber hits the road. Uh, and this is where we hit our second major snag. You can see what happens when we just say, well, let's just see what happens for k plus 1. We go ahead, Substitute it in. Uh, I'm going to say there exists some value q, which is also an integer, um, which is going to give me my new multiple of 6. And then I do my substitution into the left-hand side and see, well, what's going to happen here? Now, those of you who remember mathematical induction will re recall that what you want to do here is try and twist and turn this algebraically in order to make the inductive hypothesis, the assumption, to make it sort of appear and then you can do a substitution and then hopefully things fall out in the wash and you arrive, uh, if you're starting on the left hand side, you arrive on the right hand side. Now when I have a look at my inductive hypothesis which is up here, k cubed minus k equals 6p, I can actually already see k cubed and minus k in the left hand side of my ex equation here, right? Uh, expression, I should say. This is the k cubed, and here is the minus k. So I could just substitute those for 6p by assumption. And then there's a bit of other simplifying as well that will happen. So let's watch what happens, what takes place when I do that substitution. You can see I've brought this k cubed minus k out the front. I've substituted for 6q. Uh, I notice my plus and my minus 1 have cancelled with each other, leaving me with this. And then I have uh, done this factorization because I noticed the 3k uh, can come out the front. 
Now at this point, you pause, because you think, great, I, I want to prove that this is equal to, um, actually that should be a 6p, not a 6q, let's fix that up. I've got this part at the front, this part's divisible by 6, great, and then I have to deal with this. What do I do with this set of terms over here? Now, the short answer is, probably in this scheme, the most efficient way to go about this is not very efficient at all, I have to kind of start a whole new proof by induction to handle this part of things. Prove that it is divisible by 6, and then I can do a substitution, so I've got this multiple of 6, another multiple of 6, and then everything will be fine. Um, and it's worth noting, sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have sort of a babushka doll situation, um, it feels like you're differentiating by the chain rule, it's like, oh, not function of a function, it's mathematical induction of a mathematical induction. This is the second snag that I was talking about can work, but certainly doesn't seem elegant, right? Is there another way that we can go about this? And the answer is yes. We're gonna have to improve, uh, sort of, not improve, we're gonna have to uh, employ some uh, deductive logic that we're not used to using in the context of number theory, um, but it's gonna be much more elegant, uh, even though it might in the end end up being sort of a similar amount of working, but I think that the flow of the logic will be much clearer. So let's rewind, let's go back to uh, treating this question from the beginning. How can we go about proving this without resorting to induction? What I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna take this uh, expression here, a cubed minus a, and I'm gonna see if I can gain any insight from it by manipulating it algebraically. So what I'm gonna do is I'm considering a cubed minus a. Now, what can I do with this? The most obvious thing that jumps out at you is say, well, I can factorize this. Um, in fact, I can factorize it a couple of times. I can first take out that common factor of a, that leaves me with a squared minus one. And then you think, fantastic, I have difference of squares here. So I've got a outside of a minus one, a plus one. And at this point, it's all factorized. And you might think, well, what can I do with this? What I want you to notice is that what you have is a product of three different numbers, but they're not just three random numbers. These numbers, a and a minus one and a plus one, they're actually connected, they're related, in that if I put them in this order, a minus one and then a and then a plus one, what you can see here is I actually have three consecutive integers. You've got one number here in the middle, a number one less and a number one more. So I've got three integers in a row here. Now, this is important, it's so important that I'm gonna write it down. I'm gonna say, therefore, a cubed minus a is the product of three consecutive integers. Now, at this point, uh, three consecutive integers. At this point, I need to think before I make any further uh, you know, algebraic marks on my page, how can I use this property? The fact that a cubed minus a can be written as the product of three consecutive integers, how can I use this to construct a proof? Here's how it's gonna go about. I, I wanna prove that this is divisible by six, right? Now six itself, I can break into two component pieces because six is a composite number. If you were to factorize six, it would break into two times three. Now what that means is, if a number is divisible by six, that implies it's also divisible by two, because it's even, and it's also gonna be divisible by three. It should be a multiple of three as well. So therefore, if I can prove this in the opposite direction, right, because these are equivalent statements, if you're divisible by six, then it, it must be true that you're divisible by two and three, but if you're divisible by two and three, you must be divisible by six. If I can prove uh, this sort of pair of results, then I have proved the uh, initial result that I set out to, uh, to actually prove. So that's, that's my uh, roadmap through this question, okay? If I can prove this divisible by two, as divisible by three, I'm good to go. Now, if you just think about this, and maybe an example would be instructive here. If you thought of three uh, consecutive integers, any three consecutive integers, like say, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, what you see here is that if you pick any three consecutive integers, um, at least one of them is going to be even. In this case, I've got 14 and 16. They're both even, right? But if I went along to the next one, let's suppose I, I scrapped 14 and I consider the next one, you can see here, uh, even though I don't have 14 anymore, 16 is still there. So you're always gonna have at least one number that's a, uh, a multiple of two. And because you've got three numbers, you also will always have a number that's a multiple of three. In this case, it's 15. Um, if I were to scrap 15 and say, well, let's 
put on the next one, now 18 is my multiple of three. And if I rewind, you can see um, I had 14, 15, 16. So this time the multiple three is the middle number. So if there's always gonna be at least one multiple of two, there's always gonna be at least one multiple of three. When you multiply them together, two and three will definitely be one of your pairs of your factors. So therefore six is also going to be a factor.